Hello everyone, this is Dr. Young, and in this video we're going to learn how to write the names of ionic compounds when we're given the formulas. So to do that, we have to take a look at a few rules. Um, I made this sort of flow chart thing for you for how the different rules for cations versus anions. Um, I won't write on it for a second, so those of you who are not in my class, if you want to screenshot this and keep it for practice, go for it. Um, those of you who are in my class, you do have a copy of this. It'll be posted online somewhere. But when I look at a compound, I, right, I have a formula. So let's just say, for example, I have CaF2. Uh, and I want to know how to name that. I need to break it up into two parts. I need to name the cation part and the anion part. So if I take a look at the cation, right, your cations are going to come in two flavors. They're either going to be monoatomic cations, so that just involves one atom, right? Or they're going to be polyatomic cations, which means that cation has more than one uh, uh, atom in it. So like the only example that uh, I tend to show my students for polyatomic cations would be something like ammonia, which is NH4+, plus, right? That has five atoms in it, but still just one ion. Um, if you have a polyatomic cation, you just, you just say the name of the thing. If it's called ammonium, you call it ammonium. If it's called hydronium, you call it hydronium, whatever, whatever that thing is. And then for simple monatomic cations, it's super easy. You, you don't do anything. You don't change the name at all. So whatever that element name is, you just keep it. Right, so if on the periodic table it says it's lithium, you call it lithium. If it says it's titanium, you call it titanium. Calcium is calcium, aluminum is aluminum, copper is copper, etc. You don't have to change anything like that. So for me, I have calcium here, and so I know the first part of this name is simply calcium. I don't need to change anything. It's not calcate, it's not calcite or calcium or anything like that. You just, calcium is calcium. You just leave it. So I don't have to change the cation name at all. One thing that we'll talk about in a, in a little bit here is that if you have um, a cation that is a transition metal, we will need to say what the charge is on that metal, right? Because hopefully you've seen in, in previous videos, right? the issue with the transition metals is that, is that they can have different charges. And um, you can't read someone's mind and just guess what the charge is. So you have to write what the charge is so that everyone knows that you're talking about um, iron 2 chloride, not iron 3 chloride. If you just say iron chloride, it's ambiguous. No one knows what you're talking about. So in this case, right, so whatever the charge is on your metal, that's the Roman numeral that you put right after it. You put it in parentheses. And I'll do a bunch of examples like that. You've probably seen examples before, but I'll, I'll do some uh, uh, in a little bit here. So that, that's the only thing you have to do worry about with cations. You don't change the name. If it's a transition metal, you have, you have to put the Roman numerals for the charge on the metal. Now if I go to the anions, right, so if I go over the anions over here, it's a little more complicated. Um, for the anions, right, your monatomic anions, the ones that are just uh, one single atom that has a charge, you do need to change the ending. You need to change the ending to ide. So that means if you look at the periodic table, you're going to change oxygen to oxide, or fluorine to fluoride, or sulfur to sulfide, iodine to iodide, etc. So you have to have the ide ending, so it changes to ide. If you have a polyatomic anion, um, and there are a lot of polyatomic anions out there, there's so many. Um, for us, for my classes, my 100 level classes, um, these down here are gonna be the, the most common ones. These are gonna be the ones that you're gonna see on quizzes and tests. These will be the ones that I use primarily. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, to do all of the like perchlorite and hypochlorite and sulfite and bi or bi bi um, phosphate or something like that. Uh, thiosulfate, you know, don't, don't worry about all that stuff for my 100 level classes, but these are super common ones, sulfate, nitrate, phosphate, carbonate, bicarbonate, acetate, and hydroxide, really, really common. So if you see any of those, you just simply say their name, you just say sulfate. You don't say like sulfur oxide, sulfur tetroxide, or something like that, you just say sulfate. So in my example, I have fluorine here, right, so here I have fluorine, and again, the idea is that I change that ending to fluoride. So I change that ending to fluoride. So that means that the name of my CaF2 is simply calcium fluoride. And that's it. That's the name. That's all I need to do to name that sucker. One thing I want to mention while I'm here is that um, uh, a temptation for students when they're looking at ionic compounds is to try to like take this two into account. Um, you know, like they're always asked, well, what do I do with the two? And for ionic compounds, you do not use multipliers. So ionic compounds uh, do not, they do not have multipliers. So ionic compounds do not use multipliers. 
And by multipliers, I mean things like, right, di, tri, tetra, etc. None of those. You're not going to say that. So this is not like calcium difluoride or anything like that. It's just calcium fluoride. Uh, we don't need to say the di because it's assumed that there's two Fs because, again, compounds have to be overall neutral. And if calcium has a two plus charge, fluorides each have a negative one charge, it must be that there are two fluorines. So it's redundant to say, oh, hey, by the way, there's two fluorines because there has to be two fluorines. So we don't use multipliers um, for ionic compounds. So let's do some more examples to really to drill this home here. So let's take a super common uh, element. You guys probably all know the name of NaCl, right? Na, if you look on the periodic table, we've just got sodium. And then if you look at the chlorine, right? Instead of chlorine, it becomes chloride. So it's your good old table salt, sodium chloride. You've probably all heard that name. But again, notice that I changed the ending of that anion to ide. Cations did the same, anion changed to ide. If I go over here to MgBr, Mg stands for magnesium. And bromine is now going to switch to bromide, so magnesium bromide. And again, here's an example where I have two bromines, but I don't say anything. I don't say dibromide. I don't put any multipliers in. Same thing for this example over here. K stands for potassium. So we have potassium. And then I might be tempted to say like phosphorus oxide or something like that, but I need to practice with my polyatomic ions so that I recognize, oh, hey, this PO4... That's this thingy. That's this. That's PO4. That's phosphate. So I don't say like phosphorus oxide. I just say phosphate. So potassium phosphate because that thing is phosphate. If I do some more examples down here, here I have Na against sodium. And then OH is another common one where I get people try to say like hydrogen oxide. But again, you want to look down here and say, oh, wait, no. Hey, look. I have an OH, that's called hydroxide. So this would be sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide. And then lastly, uh, and I have an example of a polyatomic cation, NH4, right? Again, if I practice this and I know these better, NH4 I know is called ammonium. And then again, my chlorine becomes chloride. So then I have ammonium chloride. And so I've just named all of those. Notice again, no multipliers. The cation names don't change at all. And I did have to change the endings of those, um, those anions. So let me do a few more with the transition metals and then we'll... So here, <clears throat> here's, here's five examples. I have CuCO3. Now at first glance here, Right, I have Cu, which I know is copper. And I have CO3, which I know is carbonate. Carbonate is CO3 minus 2. But because copper is a transition metal, I need to do a little bit of extra work. Right, copper is a transition metal. Which means the charge on it could be um, a number of different things. Since it's a transition metal, the charge could be any number of things. You can look them up on a periodic table, the most common ones. But the idea is that we just say what it is. We just tell you what it is. So I don't know if this is copper 1 carbonate, copper 2 carbonate, some other co uh, copper carbonate. But if I have the formula, I can deduce what it must be. And I can deduce it, right, because while I don't know what copper, the charge on copper is, I do know what carbonate is. According to the periodic table, carbonate, or not uh, the periodic table, my, my table over here, Carbonate has a minus 2 charge on it. So I know that overall I have two negatives over here. The carbonate gives me two negatives. And again, since compounds are overall neutral, right? I know that there must be two positives to balance out those two negatives. And since I know that there must be two positives, those two positive charges must be on that copper. It must be that I have copper 2 ions. I have coppers that are plus 2. So right here in between the words copper and carbonate, I put Roman numeral 2, so this is copper 2 carbonate. And again, the copper 2 carbonate, the copper 2 part is supposed to mean that I have copper 2 plus ions. So I had deduced what it was, and then I'd report my name as copper 2 carbonate. If I do the same thing over here with the manganese compound, so I've got manganese and I have oxygen, so manganese. 
manganese, I'm going to leave a space for the Roman numerals, and then oxide. And so if I look at my manganese oxide species, I don't know if it's manganese 2 oxide, manganese 4 oxide, what's going on here? So I do the same thing to deduce what the charge must be on that manganese. I know that my oxides are minus 2, but you'll notice that I have two of them, right? I have two things that are negative 2, so altogether I have four negative charges, right? If you look at the periodic table, you'll see that oxides are minus 2. Again, if we have two of them, then we have negative 4 altogether. And again, because this is a, a neutral compound, I don't see any overall charges, I know there must be a plus 4 charge. And since there's only one manganese metal, there's only one cation, it must be that this manganese has a plus four charge on it. And so you notice that whenever I do these, I'm kind of working my way sort of clockwise here to deduce what the metal must be, what the charge on the metal must be. And in this case, it must be mang manganese four oxide. So I'll write the Roman numeral four, put it in parentheses, and I've got my name. Apparently, this is manganese four oxide. Let's do a couple more here. Um, so I've got silver and sulfide, so silver, sulfide, but again silver is a transition metal, I don't know what the charge is on it. In this case, sulfur is a minus 2, or in all cases, sulfide is a minus 2. Again, look at the periodic table, it's in group 6. And then I need to figure out then what my silvers must be, right? It must be that there's a plus 2 charge on my, uh, for my cation side. The difference with this one is that I have two cations, I have two silvers. So I have a silver and I have another silver. And I need to distribute this charge onto them in order to make it so that it's plus two overall. And so it must be then that each of these silvers has a plus one charge. That'll give me plus two altogether. And so it must be that I have two silver ones that are giving me that plus two charge to cancel out the negative two charge on the sulfur. And so this would be silver 1 sulfide, silver 1 sulfide. If it was silver 2 sulfide, it would just be uh, AGS. It would just be AGS because you'd have a silver with a plus 2 charge and a sulfur with a minus 2 charge. But this is silver 1 sulfide because the plus charge, again, the plus charge um, from, these, from, these, um, from the metals is what the Roman numeral represents. If I look down here at my nickel... Here's my nickel uh, chloride. Nickel chloride, same deal. I've got, uh, they, uh, chlorides are all minus one, but there's four of them, so I've got four negatives. And that must mean I have a positive four. And the, oh, I only have one atom to put it on, so it must be that this is nickel four. Nickel four chloride. And then lastly, this is one of the more complicated ones, but let's just do this. So we've got vanadium. Um, excuse me, if I can spell vanadium. So vanadium oxide. And then the same thing. <clears throat> I don't know what the charge on the vanadium is, but I do know what the charge on the oxygen is. So I know that they're all minus twos, but I have five of them, so there's ten negatives altogether. There's ten negative charges altogether with those five oxides. So that must mean that there's ten positive charges, so this all balances out. But again, this is distributed on two vanadiums, right? I have two vanadiums. So the charge on each of these vanadiums must be plus five, because that's how I'm going to get to plus ten. So this would be a vanadium five oxide. And so that's how you uh, name compounds uh, that are, that you name ionic compounds, whether they have transition metals or not, whether they have polyatomic ions or not. That's it. So I would recommend you just practice a whole bunch. If you have questions or comments, you can go ahead and leave them down below and then just study up and have a good day.